This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. This is The Quarantine Report. Today marks the 75th anniversary of the U.S. dropping the bomb, the atomic bomb, on Hiroshima, 75 years ago today, ushering in the atomic age, August 6, 1945. This is J. Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist credited with coordinating the creation of the atomic bomb, head of the Manhattan Project, describing his feelings as the first nuclear explosion in history lit up the Trinity blast site in New Mexico, the test site, on July 16, 1945. He knew the world would not be the same. Two people. Laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty. And to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. That's the scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer quoting the Bhagavad Gita. Well, we turn now to look at how the U.S. government controlled the narrative about the race to build and use the first atomic bomb, especially by controlling how that story was portrayed in the media. This is the focus of a new book called The Beginning or the End, How Hollywood and America Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. The Beginning or the End is also the name of a 1947 movie by MGM. We'll learn more about that and so much more with journalist Greg Mitchell, who's written extensively on Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings, also the author of Atomic Cover-Up and Hiroshima in America with Robert J. Lifton, former editor of Nuclear Times magazine. It's great to have you with us, Greg. Terrible anniversary, the 75th right. anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb, ushering in the nuclear age. Greg, before we talk about the film, the beginning or the end, that started to recreate a narrative about what happened, for people who are not familiar with what happened then, the significance of J. Robert Oppenheimer, President Truman's decision to drop the bomb, uh, tell us why the bomb was dropped and the criticism at that time through to today that was not so much heard at the time. Uh, yes, thank thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, well, you know, it, it, uh, the uh, the stated reason for dropping the bomb, which has has become what I, I call the official narrative, really to this day, as as we've seen again with the media coverage of the the past month, um, was that it was the only thing that could end the war. Um, it saved a million a million American lives. The Japanese would not have surrendered. We would have had a costly invasion of Japan, and we really needed to drop the bomb. It was the only thing that worked. Uh, this came out in Truman's initial statement, uh, where he, he called Hiroshima a military base. So, from the beginning, it was important to to communicate to the American people that this was uh, th th this was a decent and uh, necessary act. And of course, evidence has emerged uh, over the decades, uh, which shows that uh, there were alternatives. Uh, for example. Uh, Truman had just gotten Russia uh, to declare war on Japan, to promise to declare war on uh, around August 9th. Um, and there are, there are many people who believe that uh, the J Japan, including Truman, believe that Japan would have surrendered quickly uh, after the uh, Russian uh, declaration of war. Um, and so there, there's all sorts of evidence that has emerged that the, the use of the bomb was, was not necessary, could have been delayed or, or not used at all. Uh, but what was important was to set this narrative of justification, and it was uh, set right at the beginning, um, and uh, by the Truman and his allies, and uh, with a very willing media, uh, and then following that suppression of evidence from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, confiscation of film, footage, photographs, uh, censorship off office in Tokyo. 
uh, my book picks up uh, carrying the story to Hollywood. And I, I, I think it tells the, the whole story of this period and what happened in this crucial turning point. Uh, through, through uh, oddly through this uh, rather entertaining story about this movie, because the the way that uh, Truman and the military uh, intervened to make uh, to to adjust the movie and totally get get the revisions in the script uh, to reflect this official narrative, uh, rather than raise questions about the bomb, and then ultimately when the movie came out, it was nothing more than pro pop than uh, propaganda and. Um, and so really, in the story of this movie, uh, and, and as I tell in the book, it really reflects so much about this turning point in America where we are set on this path to uh, endorsing uh, the use of the bomb you know, by most in the media and by you know, many among the public or right to, uh, to this day. Greg, a very quick thing before we talk about the film, that other film you talk about, the U.S. government secretly filmed the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, not just from the sky, but the devastation on the ground brought that film back to uh, the scientists at uh, Los Alamos, uh, who did the Manhattan Project, made the bombs. Right. And the reports are that these scientists threw up. They were vomiting as they saw this film, horrified, not understanding this would ever be used on Japan. Um, where can you talk about everyone from Albert Einstein to J. Robert Oppenheimer and how they ultimately felt that film would be then highly classified for decades? Obviously, right. not incriminating, not sharing nuclear secrets, but because of its huge effect. Yeah, well, in, in fact, uh, as the book shows, the MGM movie, uh, the beginning or the end, was actually inspired uh, by one of these scientists. Uh, and there were so many of the atomic scientists who, who were appalled by what had happened with the use of the bomb and the dangers for the future. Uh, and so one of these uh, scientists from Los Al from excuse me, from Oak Ridge, contacted his former chemistry student, the actress Donna Reed, oddly. And uh, Donna Reed set in motion MGM making this movie. This is but Donna was, Reed, the famous actress. Her yeah. science teacher? Her high school chemistry teacher ended up in the Manhattan Project. He wrote her a letter two months after the bombing saying that uh, she must get Hollywood to make a big budget movie that would warn the world about the dangers of uh, remaining on this nuclear path. Uh, and, and of course, as you mentioned, Albert Einstein was very much uh, allied with that. It was, it was probably the leading uh, spokesman for that. Um, and you know, Donna Reed uh, set in motion where MGM uh, did start, uh, did launch this movie uh, at Paramount. Uh, they launched a competing movie with Ayn Rand of all people as the screenwriter. Uh, so the book talks talks a good deal about that. Uh, uh, Ayn Rand's script was ultimately too too wacky even for Hollywood. And so the uh, Paramount then threw in with uh, MGM uh, on their movie, on their, on their terrible movie. But, um, but in any case, the scientists did, uh, a large number of them did very much turn against the bomb. Um, and, um, and, and partly for their troubles, they were, uh, they were, uh, the leading scientists were surveilled and followed and their phones tapped by the FBI. You mentioned the confiscation of this footage. Um, just you know, very, very, very briefly, both the Japanese elite Japanese newsreel team and then a U.S. military uh, team filmed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the, the weeks and months after the bombing. Uh, the U.S. footage was all color footage. Uh, it was uh, probably all. Whenever you see any color footage uh, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it comes from this U.S. military team. And I, I told the story first in Atomic Cover Up. A book, I, a book I wrote a few years ago, and now I've just directed a film, also called Atomic Cover-Up, uh, that explores how both the Japanese footage and the American footage was suppressed for decades, uh, because it, it just it showed too much of the human effects of the bombing. Uh, and so that's—but that's kind of a related story to, the, to, to my current book, because Hollywood essentially did the same thing. It was, you know, it was uh, different, but it was taking a, taking a movie script completely— Revising it, uh, changes ordered by the, even the White House. Uh, a, a costly scene was re, had to be reshot on orders from Truman and the White House uh, that would explain his decision to use the bomb uh, more more favorably, you might say, uh, which MDM did. So I mean, it's it's quite an incredible just that one example among many of a, a, a sitting president ordering a movie studio 
to uh, reshoot the key scene in a movie to reflect more favorably on on him and and what he did. Well, Greg Mitchell, I want to turn to the present day and where the U.S. now stands on the use of, of nuclear weapons, not just 75 years ago, but right. today you write um, that 75 years after the, the first use of nuclear weapons, uh, it's still supported uh, uh, by a majority of Americans. You cite a recent survey conducted by YouGov and the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists that found that more than a third would support a nuclear strike on North Korea if North Korea tested a long-range missile capable of reaching the U.S., even if that meant the death of a million civilians. Yeah, I mean, what, what's really driven my work uh, for almost four decades now is, you know, people say, why does Hiroshima matter today? Or, you know, you can't change history, even if, if, you, if you could. Uh, but the, certain, the, the simple fact is that, is that America continues to have a, what's called a first-use policy. It means any, any president can, is enabled or, uh, to uh, order a uh, preemptive nuclear strike, in other words, in response to a conventional war or, as you just mentioned, a threat, a uh, perceived threat from, uh, from an, a rival or an enemy. Uh, I think most people still think America uh, would only launch in retaliation, but that's not true. We've had a first-use policy or first-strike policy, and there have been efforts to change it. Uh, it's, not, it's not happened. So we still have a first-use president. Now we have a president in the White House who, you know, many people are very fearful uh, of what he might do in a crisis or in response to a tweet, even. Uh, not exactly the stable genius that he claims to be. Uh, and so we have this policy still in, you know, still in effect. And uh, that's why I, I keep coming back to Hiroshima every, every year and, and in books and articles, is because the, the media particularly continues to endorse the use back then. Certainly, uh, no president has really come out against it. Top officials in, is continue to endorse it. Uh, and the, you know, the fact that we're making, you know, we, on the one hand, we'll say we must never use nuclear weapons again. They're too terrible and so forth. But, you know, the two times we already used them, you know, was, was, was necessary. And um, so it's this endorsement of the use of the bomb then. I think we could all rather easily see if we launched another nuclear attack, the same defenses would come out. We have this in our background. We have this in our history. The, the world largely condemns it, but it is in our history. And, uh, it, and it at that time, Greg Mitchell, the number of people who died believed to be over 200,000, the two atomic bombs that were dropped? Yes, 200,000. Well, Hiroshima I'm going to leave Nagasaki. it there on this 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. Thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.